This is the American Empire Element 1, about how America developed into a world power in the late 1800s. And if you take a look at the slide in front of you, you can see various political cartoons to that effect. This one down here, I think, is actually pretty interesting. If you pause this and take a look at it for a second, you'll notice that the North American continent is Uncle Sam eating the little fish of Cuba out here in the Caribbean Sea. I think that's kind of a unique one. I've never seen that one before. But in any event, this is about how we become an empire by the late 1800s. But in order to understand that, we have to go back a little bit further, all the way back to 1865 in the conclusion of the Civil War. And you'll find out at that time that the U.S. was really not interested in having an empire of any sort, at least not at that time in history. In 1865, the U.S. was pretty much indifferent to the outside world. We were a lot more focused on domestic things, like dealing with Reconstruction and starting the healing process from the Civil War. Building an industrial economy based on the railroads of Cornelius Vanderbilt. The oil fields of John D. Rockefeller. Andrew Carnegie Steel used to build skyscrapers and bridges like the one you see here. And of course, building that economy on the golden age of American invention, uh, with inventors like Thomas Edison coming up with a light bulb and J.P. Morgan financing those to turn them into uh, mass-produced industries. We were also starting to focus on urbanization and making cities more sanitary and livable. And out west, we were in the middle of a different kind of civil war, if you will, this one lasting for almost 30 years, called the Plains Wars, starting in the 1860s, right about the time of and shortly thereafter the Civil War, and lasting all the way up to 1890. These wars were fought to make it safe for white settlers to go out west and get a fresh start, and it seemed like that's what everybody in America was doing after the Civil War, either reconstructing the South or going to work in factories or living in cities or going out west. We were more concerned with what we were doing, not so much about what was happening in the rest of the world. But while we were doing that, other nations were beginning to quote-unquote scramble for colonies, like on this slide you see in front of you here. After the Berlin Conference of 1884, Africa was divided up among the major European powers. And the same thing was happening in Asia and other parts of the world. Other nations were picking up colonies, and we were a little late to the game. But we'd catch up pretty quickly and have our own empire by 1900. After decades of isolationism, this was an astonishing departure from our traditional anti-colonialism. We had been a colony of Great Britain, and we didn't like it. From that point on, we wanted to just be to ourselves and not really get involved in any foreign affairs or pick up any additional colonies. But now, by the late 1800s, we did, and it made us a world power. So, what made us want to do that? What were the reasons for American expansion in the first place? Well, the first one was mass production and in industry and agriculture, uh, a booming population, and a new sense of power that led us to look for markets beyond our own shores. By 1900, we'd already expanded all the way to California, it was time to go see what else was out there. Because we had already made it to the West Coast, many felt like we needed to relieve the pressure, that we needed to expand or we would explode. Also, the yellow journalism of Joseph Pulitzer and William Randolph Hearst described foreign exploits as manly adventures. More on the yellow journalism aspects later on, and on Pulitzer and Hearst. Others wanted to expand because they were missionaries looking for new souls to Christianize. And, of course, you can't forget the concept of manifest destiny. Many people in America felt like we needed to expand because we were the strongest and we were destined to expand to take these quote-unquote savage peoples and lead them to civilization and away from the barbarism and the oppression that they were feeling and going through at that time. It was our God-given duty to do that. Well... That, and of course the idea of watching other nations carve up Africa into colonial holdings in the 1880s, and then again in China in the 1890s, well, we kind of decided that we were going to look over the shoulder here and see that maybe this wasn't so bad. After all, we'd already missed out on Africa, and Asia had gotten carved up as well by the British, the French, the Germans, the Japanese, and the Russians. By the late 1800s, a lot of Americans were thinking it's time to get involved economically, if nothing else. If we can't have colonies of our own, let's find a way to sell them some stuff. But if you're going to take colonies, or even just make your way into somebody else's colonies to sell them stuff, you're going to have to have a strong navy like we have today. And today's modern navy started 
back in the late 1800s. Again, if you're going to have colonies around the world, you've got to have means to protect them, and you've got to have places for these ships to park. You need naval bases. Those are two good reasons to have islands all over the world and colonies all over the world. So it's not just about selling them stuff, although that's a big thing. I mean, every time you pick up a colony, you've got a, a whole new island's worth of people looking to buy your products. But you also need places to store your navy and allow that navy to go out and protect your colonial interests. And the guy who started that ball rolling for the United States was this guy right here, Alfred T. Mahan. In his 1890 book, The Influence of Sea Power Upon History, Mahan had argued that control of the sea was key to world dominance. The book became known worldwide, helped stimulate a global naval race as every nation was now building up navies, but also led to this idea of more colonies. If you were going to build a big navy after all, well, you were doing so to have more colonies. But there's one other effect it had as well. Mahan's book and the global naval race that came from it also led to calls for a canal in Central America between the Atlantic and the Pacific. Nobody knew exactly where it was going to be. Uh, that spot would eventually be Panama right here, but at that time it was just a glimmer in everybody's eye. All people knew was that they wanted one, and they wanted control of it. And so, the question became, who was going to have the best relationship with Latin America? We decided we were going to try to take the lead on this with the quote-unquote big sister policy, as you can see in the slide here. The big sister of the United States protecting and helping the little sister of Latin America. This was the brainchild of two-time Secretary of State James Blaine. His main idea is that he wanted the United States to lead in Latin America and get there ahead of all the other countries and open up economic markets in all of the countries you see on this map here at some point or another. This led to the Pan-American Conference of 1889, which was basically designed to improve economic relations between uh, North America and South America and Central America as well. That conference would continue on for many decades following. But while we were building our quote-unquote American empire, we had to deal with some conflicts in other parts of the world as well. We almost got into a fight with Germany about the Samoan Islands in 1889. German Samoa had become independent, and American Samoa was still a U.S. possession. That put our ships in close proximity and almost caused some problems. We also almost found ourselves going to war with Italy after 11 Italians were lynched in New Orleans in 1891. Uh, that almost led to war as well. The U.S. almost went to war with Chile after two U.S. soldiers were killed down there in 1892. Chile threatened to attack the U.S. coast, but then eventually backed down. And we almost went to war with Canada in 1893 over seal hunting that was going on in Alaska. But none of those potential problems were as big as the problem we almost had with Great Britain in 1895 and 1896. And it took place right down here on the border between Venezuela and British Guiana. Now, the border between British Guiana and Venezuela had been disputed, first of all, and then that heated up after gold was discovered in the region. Now, President Cleveland aggressively invoked the Monroe Doctrine, which said, you know, European nations stay out of our business in the Western Hemisphere. Britain basically just blew it off and saw it as another U.S. attempt to just kind of twist the lion's tail a little bit, the lion being the symbol of Great Britain. They basically said it's not Uncle Sam's business at all, but the U.S. had already set the border and was willing to fight to maintain the border that they had drawn on the map line to protect those gold interests. Britain was already being challenged in other parts of the world and backed off. But the result was actually pretty interesting. For the first time in history since the American Revolution, we actually started to get along with Great Britain. The result was called the Great Reconciliation with the United States. After a century of the U.S. quote-unquote twisting the lion's tail every chance they got, the British started quote-unquote, patting the eagle's head. I'm not making that stuff up. That's the way it was said in the newspapers. This new cordial relationship between the two would exist throughout the 20th century, with the U.S. often taking the lead in World War II and into the Middle East and things along those lines. Britain's been kind of the Robin to our Batman ever since. I also want to take some time in this element to discuss the near 100 years of history 
that leads up to the eventual annexation of Hawaii that will take place as part of the Spanish-American War discussed in Element 2. But we're going to take a look again at the 100 years of history leading up to that. Hawaii is obviously very beautiful, and Americans had been enchanted with it since the early 1800s. Now remember, that's only 10 to 20 years after the American Revolution and after we became our own country, so it seems like kind of a big leap that we'd already be out in the Pacific and even know about Hawaii. But it had been a very popular stop for rest and provisions for many ships for uh, decades already. Missionaries who were looking to convert the natives to Christianity had arrived there as early as 1820, which was a full 40 years before the Civil War, and about 80 years before we took possession of Hawaii in any way. But it wasn't just converting natives to Christianity that was the big draw for Hawaii. We had been aware of it for almost 100 years, and there was one reason for that, and one reason only. Sugarcane. Hawaii eventually becomes a very important center for U.S. sugar production. In the 1840s, the United States warned other world powers to stay away from Hawaii for various reasons, sugar being among the most prominent. Now, let's reflect back for a second here to make sure we know where we are with the development of the American Navy. From the American Revolution all the way up to the Civil War of the 1860s, most of our ships had been wooden and deployed primarily in the Atlantic Ocean. By the late 1800s, the Navy has grown into steel ships, and they're going out farther than they really ever have before, well out in the, into the Pacific, to gain territories, to gain colonies, and protect your interests in those territories and colonies, such as something like sugar. Well, in order to make that happen, you're going to need those ships constantly close by, and therefore you're going to need a place to dock those ships. So in 1887, the United States signed a treaty with Hawaii for the rights to build a naval base at a place that might be somewhat familiar to you, Pearl Harbor. But the relationship wasn't always good. In a familiar trend that we saw with Native Americans on the U.S. continent, uh, what we found in Hawaii was a group of people in the early 1800s kind of living their own lives and their own culture the way they liked it. And eventually, our continued contact with them led to diseases that reduced the Hawaiian population to one-sixth of what it was before contact with the Anglos, meaning us. As a result, American sugar producers start bringing in Chinese and Japanese immigrants to work the fields. Soon, those Chinese and Japanese immigrants are outnumbering both the whites and the native Hawaiians as a part of the Hawaiian population on the islands. But that's more to explain the demographics of Hawaii now, not necessarily to explain the eventual annexation. What does explain the eventual annexation of Hawaii is the McKinley Tariff of 1890. Now remember, a tariff is something that makes it more difficult for a foreign nation to sell products in your country. It basically puts a tax on the goods that foreign nations want to sell here, which means that they have to raise their production costs because they have to account for that tariff. And in order to make any money, they have to raise their overall prices to make a profit and even make it worth it to stay in business. Well, if their prices are higher, it protects American businesses because consumers will now buy the less expensive product, in this case, American sugar. Well, the McKinley Tariff of 1890, which was one of the highest in U.S. history, raised the barriers against Hawaiian sugar, almost treated them like a foreign nation, which hurt the market, and white sugar producers only saw one solution, make Hawaii a part of the United States. Now, Lileo Kalani, who was the last Hawaiian queen, opposed annexation, saying that native Hawaiians should control the islands. The white minority on the island revolted in 1893 and, assisted by U.S. troops, overthrew the queen. Benjamin Harrison was the president when all this happened, but his term expired before official annexation could take place. His successor, Grover Cleveland, felt that the United States had wronged the Queen and her people, but he really couldn't muster up any support to take all of this back. So, Hawaii was eventually annexed by William McKinley in 1898 during the Spanish-American War. And a very familiar name became the first territorial governor of Hawaii, Sanford B. Dole. If you still don't get it, think Dole Fruit Company and all those pineapples. Okay, that's it. Thanks for listening.